Hello friends, I welcome you all to this discussion lecture series for Civil Services Prelims 2017 question paper. My name is Dr. Mahipal Singh Rathod and in this part 2 of the discussion series, I will be discussing the questions of history, art and culture, polity and international relations. So all the other topics you will find in part 1 that will be discussed by Bhumika Sani ma'am. So history had 14 questions this year, the uh, usual, uh, no change in the number or decrease. Polity had 22, a great increase past 2 years, the number of questions from Polity had gone down. International Relations 3. Study IQ has launched its pendrive and tablet courses for UPSC IES examination. So those of you who are preparing for 2018 and want to prepare from their home and do not want to go to any metro cities, you can avail our pendrive and tablet courses or Android courses. If you order today, that is 20th of June, you will get a flat discount of 5000 on using this code UPSC5K. But this is only for today, 20th June. Okay. So let us begin with history, art and culture series. First question, in the context of Indian history, the principle of diarchy refers to was it division of central legislature into two houses? No, that was bicameralism. Introduction of double government, central and state government? No. Having two sets of rulers, one in London and another in Delhi, no. This was the division of subjects delegated to provinces into two categories. Remember the 1919 Government of India Act? This had delegated the provinces into uh, provincial administration into two departments, two types of departments. One were administered by Indians and others were kept by the governor of the province to himself using his own council. They were governed. So this was a direct question asked from 1919 Government of India Act, diarchy. Second question from culture, the painting of Bodhisattva Padmapani is one of the most famous and oft illustrated paintings. So cave paintings are famous at Ajanta and uh, other caves as well by Bagh also but here the answer is Ajanta. Now you will remember such kind of questions only if you have studied art and culture using internet. You have seen the images, you have seen the videos. Such questions can be solved only in that manner. See, if you would have uh, looked at this image, this is Bodhisattva Padmapani. It is a very famous painting. It is often used on the covers of history books. So this is a Bodhisattva. He is holding a lotus. That is why he is called Padmapani. And this was at Ajanta. So always remember, study art and culture using internet. Watch the images, watch the videos of dance, etc. That is the only method you can solve such kind of questions. Again, from culture. The traditions of different communities, so Chaliha Sahib, Sindhi, Nandaraj, Jat Yatra, Gond, no, and Vari Varkari, Santhal, no, this is also wrong. The answer was one only. See, Chaliha Sahib is, uh, is a festival celebrated in Ulasnagar. Ulasnagar is uh, near, near Mumbai, and this is a township which has a lot of Sindhi people who migrated from Sindh after partition, and so they celebrate this Chaliha Sahib uh, uh, at there place in Ulasnagar. Nanda, Nanda, Nanda Devi Raj Jatra is once every 12 years. Okay, it is in Uttarakhand. Remember Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve National Park. Vari Varkari is, is a type of pilgrimage in Pandarpur where there is a temple of Lord Vithal. Vithal is Lord Vithal is a avatar of Lord Vishnu. Okay, so Vari Varkari is in Maharashtra Pandarpur, not Gond and Santhal. So these were the uh, correct answers. The answer was A, one only. Another question from art and culture, famous for Sun Temple, which, which place is famous for Sun Temple? Now Arsavali, Amarkantak and Omkareshwar. This question could be solved using elimination. If you know Omkareshwar, this is very famous. Omkareshwar is one of the 12 Jyotirlings in India. Jyotirlings are the temples of Lord Shiv. So Omkareshwar is in Madhya Pradesh. If you know Omkareshwar is a, is a Jyotirling, it is not a Sun Temple, so you can directly eliminate three options. So your answer is one. So even if you have never heard of Arasavali, you can take this. This is a village in uh, Shrikakulam, near Shrikakulam in Andhra Pradesh and uh, elimination method using Jyotirling. So answer was one only. Next question was rega regarding the chronology of events of Indian national movement. As I always tell that don't mug up the ears, but remember what happened first, what happened after. So sequence of events is more important rather than mugging up the ears. Now mutiny in the Indian Navy, Royal Indian Navy, this was in 1946. Rin mutiny, Quit India Movement launched. Quit India Movement was launched in 1942 and second round table conference was in early 1930s in 31. So first was this 3, 2, 1. So we have our answer 3, 2, 1. Which of the following was a very important seaport in Parkatiya Kingdom? 
Now this question, let me tell you, I personally feel this question was not supposed to be attempted because if you are a general studies history student, you are not expected to go so much deep into all the dynasties and their rule, their seaports, their administration, trade, etc. You do not have time for that. If you go so much deep into history, you won't have time for other subjects. The same is there for all these other subjects as well. There is a limit until which you should go. You should not go too much deep and waste your time. Yes, if you know about this, you have read it somewhere. Very good. Excellent. Especially if someone has history as their optional, uh, they might know this. But otherwise, I personally feel this question was not supposed to be attempted. The answer here is Motupalli. See, Kakinada, Motupalli and Masuli Patnam, they are all situated on the Andhra Pradesh coast and they were all nearby nearby only and they are all part of the Kakatiya kingdom. But Motupalli is the answer. It is famous because in 1293, Marco Polo, the famous traveler from Venice who visited China and Marco Polo also had come to India. He had visited Motupalli. He had visited, he has written about Kakatiya kingdom. Now this Kakatiya dynasty, its capital was Varangal and it was eventually conquered by the Delhi Sultanate. Remember Alauddin Khilji's southern campaign under Malik Kafur. So this was one of those dynasties that he defeated. Next question is regarding Butler Committee of 1927. What was the object or the purpose of this committee? Defining the jurisdiction of central and provincial governments, defining the powers of Secretary of State of India, censorship on press or improve the relationship between government of India and Indian states. The answer is states and government of India. Actually, this committee was sent so that the relationship between the native princely states, the princely states and the British paramount power can be determined. It can be improved. So what is paramount power? The British were paramount power in India. They were uh, all the, the all these princely kingdoms who had signed subsidiary alliances with them. They were all subordinate. They were all under the British Empire. So that is why it is called the paramount power. And this was answer is D. Determine the relationship. Consider the following pairs. Radha Khan Dev, first president of British Indian Association. Gazulu Lakshmi Narasu Chetty, founder, founder of Madras Mahajan Sabha. Surendranath Energy, founder of Indian Association. Now these all are precursor to Indian National Congress. This question has been asked because these all were there as political organizations before Congress was founded. So this is correct. Radha Khan Dev and this is correct. This is wrong. So answer is 1 and 3 only. With reference to religious history of India, consider the following statements. Sautantrika and Samitya were sects of Jainism. This is wrong. No, they were sects of Buddhism. Now Sarvastivadin held that the constituents of phenomena were not wholly momentary but existed forever in a latent form. Which of the following statements is correct? Now statement 1 is wrong. Statement 2 is correct. So, answer is 2 only. All these are Buddhist schools, Sautantrika, Samitya and the Sarvastivadin is also a philosophy in Buddhism only. So these are all related to Buddhism. The answer was B. With reference to difference between culture of Rigvedic Aryans and Indus Valley people, which of these are correct? Now three statements are given here. We have to determine which of them correctly shows the difference between Aryans and Indus Valley people. Now Rigvedic Aryans used coat of mail and helmet in warfare and Indus Valley civilization did not leave any evidence of using them. This is correct. Indus Valley civilization was a peace living civilization. We have found no weapons, but Aryans had weapons. They, they were warlike people. They fought, they fought a lot of wars. These wars are mentioned in Rig Veda. Second, Rig Vedic Aryans knew gold, silver, copper, whereas Indus Valley civilization people knew only copper and iron. This is wrong because Indus Valley people did not know about iron. So second option is wrong. Now, third option is a bit tricky. It says that Rig Vedic Aryans had domesticated the horse. Yes, this is true. Whereas there is no evidence of Indus Valley people having been aware of this animal. Now, this is a tricky statement. See, if you look at it in a generalized manner, yes, Indus Valley people did not have horse as a part of their civilization. But we have found two evidences of horse at Surkotla and Lothal. We have found horse bones and a terracotta figurine. So this statement is wrong. Answer will be one only, but UPSC can consider this also as correct. It depends on what UPSC examiners think is right. If you take it as a very generalized statement, this might be correct. But personally, I feel this is wrong and uh, answer will be one. But it might be C also one and three. We, we have to see next year when the official answer key comes out. The thing that you had to remember here was iron was not found in IVC. That is why second answer was wrong. And horse evidence has been found at Lothal and Surkotra. Another question from culture. 
with reference to Manipuri Sankirtan, which of the following statements are correct? First, it is a song and dance performance. Yes, this is correct. Symbols are used are the only musical instruments used in performance. Whenever you see such words only 100%, you should be very careful. Read the answer again. Read the options once again. Read the statements carefully because only 100% these statements are often false. So be careful in this. I'm not saying they are always false, but they are often false. That is what I have seen. Now, symbols are small instruments. They are two small metal plates that are used together to make sounds while uh, song and dance performances are going on. Third statement says that it is performed to narrate the life and deeds of Lord Krishna. Yes, this is correct. Remember, Manipuri is a big center. Uh, Manipur is a big center of Vaishnavism. It is a region where uh, Vaishnavism was developed and all the Manipuri dance as well, the classical dance that also has Krishna's life stories as an important theme. So answer here is one and three only. Now Manipuri Sankirtan was in news in December 2013 because it was added to the representative list of UNESCO intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Although this is three and a half years old, but still we can see that UPSC has been asking questions of very old current affairs. So it's not just that 11 or 12 months is sufficient. Now you have to read up a, a more amount of current affairs. You have to read up at least two, three years now. I know it is very tough, but this is, this is how tough competition is. If you have to succeed, you have to do it. Remember drumming is there so that symbol statement is wrong because drums are also used in this performance and stories of Krishna are told it is practiced primarily by the Vaishnav community. Next question is asking who are the people associated with Rayatwari settlement during the British rule. Now Lord Cornwallis cannot be there because he was the one who brought in permanent settlement in 1893. Just eliminate this you have you will have your answer. Even if you don't remember these names, Alexander Reed and Thomas Munro, they were the people who were instrumental in bringing Rayatwari settlement in 1820. But here Lord Cornwallis can be eliminated and you can get your answer easily. While we are in, on this topic, tell me which year did Lord Cornwallis bring in permanent settlement? Okay. This is a question for you. Write down, write it down in comment section. The Trade Dispute Act of 1929 was provided for. Now this Trade Dispute Act was brought in to ban on to bring a ban on strikes. There was a huge strike in 1926. The British became very much scared of strikes. They brought in a new law for this. They brought in a new act. It is called the Trade Dispute Act. Consider the following statements. Factories Act of 1881 was passed with a view to fix the wages of industrial workers and allow the workers to form trade unions. N.M. Lokhande was pioneer in organizing the labor movement in British India. This is correct. N.M. Lokhande is often called as the father of trade union movement. Now this first statement, read it carefully. Do you think the British were so liberal? They were uh, so much of, uh, they were showing so much of welfare activity that they would fix the wages. They would fix the salaries of the, uh, the mill workers, the industrial workers. No. Even if you don't know about the Factories Act, what it said, if you just remember it was in 1881, you can guess that no, this, this such kind of things could not have happened. Okay, no fixing of wages could have ever happened. So answer is two only. So what did this first Act in 1881 say? It said that anyone who is under the age of seven, those children are not allowed to work. They are prohibited. And those who are under age of 12, their working hours will be fixed. The working conditions of the laborers was the main thing that was remedied in first factory act. There were some few concessions like there will be a uh, the lunch break of half an hour, etc. So there was no fixing of wage. There was no liberty to form trade unions. It came on slowly later on, but first factory act, only the working conditions were looked after. And Lokhande is the father of trade union movement in India. So after seeing these, these two questions, I think there is a trend this year asking about uh, questions that are not related to national movement directly. So all the alternate histories that were going on, alternate chapters of the history like trade union movements, factories act, uh, history of communism about MN Roy, read upon those. If someone is attempting CAPF exam that is coming soon, that will be, these will be very important for that, uh, that exam. Okay. So such trends UPSC often carries on. So be, be aware of this. Coming on to the polity questions, there were 22 questions from polity. First question for election to the Lok Sabha, a nomination paper can be filed by anyone residing in India? Obviously not. There are a lot of people from other countries residing in India. Can they fight elections? No. A resident of the constituency from which the election is to be contested. You must have seen there are a lot of uh, elect politicians who go and fight elections from other states or other constituencies. So this is also wrong. 
any citizen of India whose name appears in the electoral roll of a constituency. Yes, this is correct. You have to be a registered voter to be eligible for filing your nomination. Any citizen of India? No. If some citizen of India has criminal cases proved against him, he cannot fight elections. Best example, Lalu Prasad Yadav. So there are restrictions on some citizens. So this is the correct one. Any citizen of India whose name appears in electoral role. Consider the following statements. In election for Lok Sabha or State Assembly, the winning candidate must get at least 50% of the votes. Is it correct? No. We have politicians who win elections even after getting 25%, 30% of the vote. Because we in India follow the first past the post system. In that, in this system, even if you are getting 30% and if your opponents are getting less than you, 27, 28%, then you are declared a winner. It is not necessary to get 50%. So the statement is wrong. According to provisions laid down in the Constitution of India, Lok Sabha, the Speaker's post goes to the majority party and Deputy Speakers to the opposition. Now this is nowhere written in the Constitution that this post has to go to the majority or ruling party. This is a convention. It has formed after independence that yes, it has been the trend. It is a convention that has formed over the period of time. So our answer is neither one nor two. So speaker is chosen from amongst the members of Lok Sabha. It is by convention. It is a member of the ruling party or alliance usually. And deputy speaker goes to the opposition. So right now Sumitra Mahajan is the speaker of Lok Sabha. She is a member of BJP. The right to vote and to be elected in India is a fundamental right, natural right, constitutional right or legal right. The answer to this is legal right. Okay, now this is derived from the constitution but it is not a constitutional right. Fundamental, it is not there. Obviously, you know you have read all the fundamental rights. Does it say anywhere that the fundamental right to vote? No. Natural, constitutional and legal. Here it is a legal right because of some legal provisions we have the right. See, it originates from the article 326 of the constitution which talks about the voting rights but it has been shaped by the RPA, Representation of People Act 1951. Because of this act, we have all the rules and regulations that who can vote, who, who can represent, who can file nominations, etc. Now, if, you're, if you have non-residents, you do not live in that area, you have unsound mind, if you are involved in crime or corrupt or illegal practices, you are not eligible to vote. You can be disbarred from voting by the election commission. So it is up to the commission according to the rules of RPA, Representation of People Act. So it is a legal right given according to the laws of India, not in the constitution. It is only derived from the article 326. Consider the following statement. Election Commission of India is a five member body. Wrong. It is a three member body. Union Ministry of Home Affairs decides the election schedule for the conduct of general and by-elections. This is also wrong. Election Commission of India decides the election schedule. Remember, you must have seen conferences by the election commission each time before elections. They have a press conference which is widely covered. They tell you all the dates when the model code of conduct comes into play, when the nomination, what is the last date to file the nominations, the last day to take back your nomination and so on. Okay, so all that schedule is given by election commission prior to the elections. Election commission resolves the disputes regarding uh, splits, mergers of recognized political parties. Yes, this is correct. The answer is three only. If you remember the Samajwadi party split that happened in 2017, early 2017 before the UP elections. Remember all the, uh, all the politicians from both those groups were going to election commission again and again. They were trying to get that. Uh, Samajwadi party symbol. So the mergers, the splits, they are decided. The uh, they are decided by election commission, giving them recognition or not. Which group has to be given official recognition? And the election commission of India website clearly states. Uh, I have taken this these lines from there only. The election commission, which decides the schedule for elections, has to take account of whether during winter constituencies may be snowbound during monsoon access to remote areas restricted agriculture cycle so that all the farmers are not busy when elections are growing going on and you have to see the schedule of the exam uh, exams in schools colleges etc so you see a lot of things have to be taken care of religious and festivals public holidays so after checking up on all these things the schedule is decided by eci these are the three current commissioners Chief Election Commissioner Dr. Nazim Zaidi, Sri A.K. Jyoti and Om Prakash Rawat, Election Commissioner. In India, judicial review implies. Now this is an analytical question from judicial review. First statement says that the power of judiciary to pronounce upon constitutionality of laws and executive orders. Yes, this might be correct. Let us read the other options. Power of judiciary to question the wisdom of the laws enacted by legislators. 
yes kind of wisdom can be challenged third power of judiciary to review all the legislative enactments before they are assented to by the president no before be getting the assent from president before becoming an act how can they go in between the parliamentary procedure judiciary cannot intervene at that time so this is completely wrong the power of judiciary to review its own judgments given earlier in similar or different cases this is not judicial review this is the judicial review best option why because here they are talking about executive orders and laws so they are talking about judicial uh, checks and balances over the legislature as well as the, as the executive part of the government see uh, this is the definition of judicial review it is a process under which executive and legislative actions are subject to review by the judiciary power of courts to assess whether a law act order is in compliance so it is not just the laws it is also the executive acts executive orders even they are under judicial review so the answer will be a next question which of the following are not necessarily the consequences of proclamation of president's rule in a state first dissolution of the state legislative assembly this is wrong state legislative assembly is not dissolved it is just suspended it is kept in a suspended state second is removal of council of ministers in a state yes cm and council of ministers do not have any power all the decisions are taken by the governor in the name of the president so all the practical power goes to the governor in a state during state emergency article 356 then dissolution of the local bodies no nothing happens to the local bodies they are there to stay so the answer is b 1 and 3 this uh, question if you remember the arunachal pradesh uh, example for last year throughout 2016 it was in news so if you can remember the arunachal pradesh example you can solve this question very easily remember two times the government was dissolved entire council of ministers was uh, uh, was dissolved Na then again new government was formed after some time and then again everyone took oath a new chief minister was formed so this happened happened twice but did the legislative assembly did it go away no the mlas were all the same they just switched parties and the government new government was made that's it and governor administers the state in the name of the president so answer is b 1 and 3 so remember practical examples always while re reading polity if you can correlate with the current news it will be easier to remember it will be easier to solve and things which are in news topics which are in news only they are asked but they will not not be asked directly they will be linked to the static portion like in this question and they will be asked in that manner so we will move on to the next question now which of the following are envisaged by the right against exploitation in the constitution of india prohibition of traffic in human beings and forced labor yes this is article 23 under right against exploitation abolition of untouchability article 17 no this is under right to equality protection of interests of the uh, minorities this is also wrong this is under under the educational and cultural rights finally prohibition of employment of children in factories mines so this is correct article number 24 this is also right against exploitation so our answer is 1 and 4 simple question from fundamental rights all you need to remember is the uh, the rights which are under grouped under which heading so the basic grouping that we study it clearly states right against exploitation are 23 24 right to equality is from 14 to 18 and cultural educational rights are 29 and 30 out of the following statements choose the one that brings out the principle underlying the cabinet form of government first option arrangement for minimizing the criticism against government this is wrong we don't have the cabinet form of government so that criti government's criticism is less second mechanism for speeding up the activities of government no this is also wrong third answer is mechanism of parliamentary democracy for ensuring collective responsibility of the government to the people this is right the cabinet form of government is so that the executive is responsible to the parliament so there is collective responsibility of the government the executive to the parliament and it is a device for strengthening the hands of the head of government no this is wrong so our answer is c Which one of the following is not a feature of Indian federalism? First, there is an independent judiciary in India. Yes, this is a feature. Powers have been clearly divided between the center and the states. Yes, we have the powers clearly divided. There is a union list, state list, and concurrent list on which laws can be framed. Federating units have been given unequal representation in the Rajya Sabha. This is also right. See, Uttar Pradesh has more seats in Rajya Sabha than other states like Sikkim. Or some or other states like West Bengal because the maximum population is of Uttar Pradesh, so there is unequal representation according to the population. It is the result of an agreement among the federating units. This is absolutely wrong. So our answer is D. Was there any agreement when India got independence? 
did did any uh, agreement happen between the various states like united provinces madras presidency bombay presidency no there was nothing that sort of that sort yes sardar vallabh bhai patel brought in all the princely states into the indian union they they had agreements with those princely states but not amongst the other federating units so this was not like usa usa all the 13 colonies when they got independence they fought together they had a agreement that we will be governed as the united states of america so they had an agreement in india there is no such agreement which of the following statements are true of the fundamental duties of an indian citizen first a legislative process has been provided to enforce these duties no there is no legislative process it is wrong the statement number 1 is wrong they are correlative to legal duties this is also wrong our answer is neither one nor two see there is no legislative process to enforce fundamental duties they are not legally binding but some laws have been made they have been passed like the prevention of insults to the national honor act 1971 so this automatically takes care of the fundamental duty that says that you have to honor the national symbols the national flag etc so that fundamental duty can be enforced using this law but there is no process that has been given in the constitution that frames so and so laws there are some laws that have been framed by the successive governments for example another example can be that now it is the fundamental duty of a parent to send his or her child to to a school because education is now fundamental right but that is not prescribed by the constitution that how you have to make these laws there is no legislative process to enforce these duties different laws are there which can enforce these duties so a second statement legal duties see you have legal duties like paying taxes if you are earning 10 lakh or 20 lakh rupees per year you are supposed to pay tax income tax because you come in the income tax bracket this income tax slab now if you are not paying income tax that is a legal duty that is not being performed but it has got nothing to do with the fundamental duties they are different they are not correlative okay legal duties and fundamental duties are not correlative in india which of the following objectives is not embodied in the preamble to the constitution so preamble is very important every word of that preamble can be asked as a question a question can be framed so which of these is mentioned liberty of thought economic liberty liberty of expression and liberty of belief let us just see the preamble itself this is the preamble read it it clearly says liberty of thought expression and belief so three options are already out thought expression and belief our answer is b economic liberty now it is talking about economic justice okay justice social economic and political there is a difference between economic justice and liberty the government will ensure economic justice so that everyone gets fair and equal uh, treatment and they get a fair and equitable share of the country's resources but there is no economic liberty in this country if tomorrow you decide to open a medical shop in your house and start selling medicines just because you know about them you are not allowed to do that there is no liberty in that respect you need a license you need to be trained as a pharmacist to sell medicines you cannot just simply start prescribing medicines to people become a doctor you have to complete a education degree you have to have a license from the medical council of india so there are restrictions on economic economic uh, liberty you cannot do whatever you want you cannot start selling anything here that you want you cannot trade in any activity that you want to do so there is no full economic liberty in the country there are some restrictions so our answer here is economic liberty read the preamble very carefully every word a question can be framed i'm telling you again this is again an analytical question democracy's superior virtue lies in the fact that it calls into activity so the question is trying to ask which of the following activities brings out the best of indian democracy or any democracy so first option says the intelligence and character of ordinary men and women yes it is the character of an ordinary voter that will decide what kind of a person is representing him and his constituency or her constituency in the parliament so the intelligence and character of ordinary men and women is a good virtue if the people themselves do not have good character they will vote for someone who does not have good character but on the other hand if the people themselves have good intelligence they have good character they will vote like minded people to the parliament so this is our answer but let's look at the other options as well the methods for strengthening executive leadership no there's no strengthening of executive leadership due to this superior individual with dynamism and vision yes this is also a virtue of democracy it will bring out the best of the leaders in a society you can see that some of the politicians that we have they have a they have a good vision they have dynamism they can lead the country 
and they have come out from the society because of the democratic processes but the more correct answer here will be this one because this is more important this is the best virtue this is the superior virtue finally a band of dedicated party workers no we don't want a band of de dedicated party workers that is not the best virtue of democracy the next question asks what is the main advantage of parliamentary form of government the executive and legislature work independently no this is not the main advantage it provides continuity of policy and is more efficient no if such was the case won't the presidential form of government that is in usa that should not be efficient at all but it is not the case they are efficient presidential form of governments are also efficient the executive remains responsible to the legislature yes this is the answer executive remains responsible this is the main advantage of parliamentary form of government when the government is formed out of the parliament itself the head of the government cannot be changed without election no this is wrong it can be changed if the ruling party tomorrow decides to change its leader the head of the government can be changed our answer is c in the context of india which one of the following is the correct relationship between rights and duties rights are correlative with duties this is the answer but let's have a look at the other options as well rights are personal and hence independent of society no this is wrong rights are not independent of the society and duties your rights can be infringing someone else's rights so they are not completely independent they don't exist in a vacuum it is all correlative to the other person's rights rights not duties are important for the advancement of personality of a citizen no both are important one cannot be one cannot advance without just uh, without the other one duties not rights are important for the stability of the state no both are important so this is also wrong rights are always correlative with duties you might have uh, read this sentence in your school textbooks they are two sides of the same coin that is completely true and remember rights can never be independent they are not independent of the society your rights can infringe upon other person's rights so they have to be curtailed there are reasonable restrictions on everything in india remember morality public order health these are some of the reasonable restrictions that have been put up on many of the fundamental rights the mind of the makers of the constitution is reflected in which of the following see everything does reflect some or the other mind of the constitution makers you cannot make fundamental rights dpsp or fundamental duties or preamble anything without using your mind but we have to see this question in a specific context the reason this was asked is that many of the famous judgments have said that supreme court has said that preamble is a key to open the minds of the makers uh, like in golaknath versus state of punjab this statement was given by supreme court and in many other cases the preamble gives a broad picture the it gives a broad context of the entire constitution so that is why it gives the idea to the mind of the makers so the answer is preamble because fundamental rights duties dpsp yes they are there but they are uh, a small part of the constitution they do not reflect the character or the nature of the entire constitution here in preamble in just a few sentences they tell us about everything that indian constitution will stand up for that is why the mind of the makers is reflected in preamble and many a time supreme court judges have said uh, said this in their uh, decisions that preamble is a key to open the minds of the makers next question parliament of india exercises control over the functions of the council of minister through adjournment motion yes question hour yes and supplementary questions yes this uh, question our answer will be 1 2 and 3 this question has directly come from lakshmikant in the parliamentary uh, system of government it says uh, this this is a line directly from uh, lakshmikant that i have quoted the parliament exercises control over the ministers through various devices like question hour discussions adjournment motion no confidence motion etc adjournment motion initially it was intended to be introduced only for matters of urgent public importance and uh, the normal business of the house was interrupted whenever an adjournment motion was brought but nowadays it has been seen that it is it is brought in quite frequently adjournment motion is brought quite frequently anything that is happening in the country brings an ad adjournment motion in the parliament so this is to censure the government okay so remember the answer will be 1 2 and 3 all of these three are instruments of the parliament to regulate the council of ministers to exercise control with reference to the parliament of india consider the following statements a private members bill is a bill presented by a member of parliament who is not elected but only nominated by the president is it true no a private member is any member who is not a minister so everyone apart from 
whoever is a minister they are all private members so just ministers are not private members even if someone is from the ruling party he is also a private member recently a private members bill has been passed in the parliament for the first time in history wrong there have been 14 uh, bills that have been passed so our answer is d neither one nor two private member anyone who is not a minister can be from the ruling party till date 14 private members bills have been passed the last one was in 1970 so it has been a long time since one was passed transgender persons protection of rights bill was brought in lok sabha in 2016 this is the 15th private member bill it has been passed in the rajya sabha but uh, it is still pending in the lok sabha so that that is why this was in news last year and in 2017 as well that is why this question was asked one of the implications of equality in society is the absence of answer is privileges see there will there will be no privileges there will be no special treatment to anyone once there is equality so after india became independent the constitution was applied there is right to equality so if someone was a maharaja or a nawab before he or she will be treated similar to a normal person if they both commit a crime there will be same punishment for an ex maharaja and a normal person so there will be no special privileges earlier it was not the case will there be restraints yes there will always be restraints in an equal society as well see modern democracies are all equal societies they strive for equality does not mean that they let anyone do whatever they want there will always be some reasonable restrictions some restraints competition yes there will be competition many companies compete with each other for more business more growth ideology yes there will be ideology in a society equality does not mean that ideology is wiped out answer is privileges this question has come from article 14 article 14 talks about equality before law that that was a british origin concept and then there is an american concept that says equal protection of the law the absence of any special privileges this is the british concept equality before law it prevents favors to any person so this is where this question comes from article 14 right to equality which principle among the following was added to the directive principles of state policy by the 42nd amendment the mini constitution which was brought by indira gandhi in 1976 during emergency so equal pay for equal work for both men and women this was there earlier participation of workers in the management of the industries yes this was brought by 42nd amendment right to work education and public assistance was there previously this was also there previously these are all dpsps article 43a says the participation of workers in the management of industries 39 says equal pay for equal work that was there in the original constitution 41 was also there right to work education and public assistance and article 43 living wage for workers promotion of cottage industries which one of the following statements is correct rights are claims of the states against the citizen no they, they are not the right claims of the state rights are privileges which are incorporated in the constitution of a state no they are not privileges rights are claims of the citizens against the state yes this is correct remember fundamental rights those are the rights that you can go to the courts if this government is not giving those rights to you if the society is not giving those fundamental rights to you you can go against the society against the state to a court of law so rights are claims of citizens against the state and not vice versa rights are privileges of only few no this is not the case we have equality right to equality everyone has equal rights so answer is c you can see that these are all analytical questions based on dpsp fundamental rights so this is the basic part of constitution you all must have studied these but you have to use some app uh, you have to apply your knowledge you have to use your knowledge in such a manner that you can arrive at the conclusion in these answers local self government can be best explained as an exercise in democratic decentralization not much to discuss here democratic decentralization was the purpose of local self government the 73rd and 74th amendment was brought and which gave the powers to the local bodies municipalities urban local bodies and panchayats in india this is the definition democratic decentralization covers a system of governance which citizens of any locality possess the right to hold local public officials accountable through various democratic means next question consider the following statements with reference to the constitution of india the directive principles of state policy constitute limitations upon legislative function no executive function no our answer is neither one nor two directive principles of state policy do not impose any limitations on legislature as well as executive there is no limitation they are just directives they are directions that ideally this should be the case so 
our answer is neither one nor two with this we come to an end of polity discussion i will now discuss the international relations question first one is broad based trade and investment agreement btia that is in news is seen between is is the negotiations held between india and european union it is between eu and india not gcc or oecd and shanghai cooperation organization see this has been in news since 2007 because we have been trying to get a agreement with them eu since 2007 last year when pradhan mantri modi visited brussels in march 2016 again this was in news uh, because the talks were going on at that time so this was all over the news btia with european union consider the following statements india has ratified the trade facilitation agreement tfo of wto tfo was signed in december 2013 Yes, India has ratified it. It has done in 2016 April. It was ratified. TFA is a part of WTO's Bali Ministerial Package of 2013. Yes, this is also correct. TFA came into force in January 2016. This is wrong. TFA came into force in this year, February 2017, and that is the reason that this question has been asked because again this was brought in news three years ago. This was huge. This was a huge deal. This TFA at WTO. So now our answer here is one and two only. Remember, India ratified TFA in 2016, sometime around April, and TFA entered into force in 2017 February. When two third countries who have signed it, they have ratified it now. So that is why it had entered into force now after almost after three and a half years of being signed. This is the last question of IR and probably the easiest. What is the importance of developing Chabahar Port? You must have read it many a times at many places about Chabahar. simple answer india will not depend on pakistan for access to afghanistan and central asia we have direct sea route to africa we have a direct sea route to all producing arab countries and pakistan will not facilitate any gas pipeline between iraq and india okay, that was another pipeline that is between tapi pipeline that is not got nothing to do with iraq this is chabahar here we have direct access to afghanistan and central asia so that we can have huge hydrocarbon resources directly shipped to mumbai here with this i come to an end of the discussion of questions now last one minute for some gyan on my behalf if you have done well most of your answers are correct you are scoring anything above 100 okay if you are scoring above 100 start preparing for mains do not waste your time the task ahead is difficult even if you have got 130 140 it does not mean that you will be you will you will have a cake walk in mains it will be very difficult so start preparing right now just after a break of two or three days if you haven't performed well learn your lessons for th- from this year's paper where have you made mistakes which topics are weak and gear up for next year 2018 because 3rd june of 2018 is not far away there are hardly there are hardly 348 days left for next year's prelims with this i come to an end of the lecture thank you very much for watching have a good day